right. We'll do tomorrow. We'll do a cowboy Christian song for Samuel the cowboy. I told him I liked his hat. He said that's a Samuel cowboy hat. I'd never heard of one of those, but I'm, I'm going to get me one one of these days. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 49. If you'll turn over there with us. We're going to be actually in three passages of Scripture tonight for a little while. And while you're turning over there, we'll be in Genesis 49. And uh, we will also be in Genesis 29. Genesis 49, Genesis 29. And a little bit in Revelation 4 and 5. Now don't let that make you nervous. I'm not going to preach all of that. But I want to find some truth in all three of those passages. And I'll give them to you again when we're turning there. So you don't have to find them all now if you don't want to. But while you're turning to Genesis 49, Genesis 49, let me say thank you again for a nice place to stay. I want to thank you for the good meal we had today and the good fellowship. And uh, we enjoyed going to the... Uh, to the nursing home today, Bethany got a marriage proposal. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding. A fellow said to her, he said, come here, let me tell you something. So she went over there. He said, I love you. And uh, he said, are you married? And she said, no, uh, someday I will be. He said, I'm available. <laughs> and uh, so she had a marriage proposal at the at the. Uh, at the nursing home, and the the comical thing about it was, I think he meant it. <laughs> I did. He was. Uh, I talked to him a little while, and I think he meant it. I'm not making fun of him, not in the least. I th I really think he meant it. But uh, but anyway, so we but we enjoyed our time there. Had a good time. I felt like the Lord met with us there, and that was a blessing. In Genesis 49, we've looked at this a couple of times already this week. Jacob has called his, brother, his sons in and he's going to speak to them about things that will happen in the last days. He starts by saying this, And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Gather yourselves together and hear ye sons of Jacob and hearken unto Israel your father. So he calls these boys in and he speaks to them under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. He prophesies to them about things that are going to happen in their future. Uh, some of the things he mentions will be things that happen uh, to them individually. Many of the things he mentions to these boys will be things that will happen in uh, their descendants and in their tribe. He starts out with Reuben, and he really doesn't talk much so much about Reuben's future as he does about Reuben's past. He tells us that Reuben is unstable as unstable as water. He said he'll not excel because he went up to his father's bed. Reuben committed immorality. And so Jacob uh, reminds him of that. Then he speaks to Simeon and Levi and he speaks to them about willfulness and about their cruelty. And when you walk in willfulness according to your own will, you'll be cruel. You won't be merciful. You won't be kind because you'll walk according to the nat your nature and according to our flesh. And our flesh is wicked. Paul said this, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. And the Bible said all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There really are, there really are two world views. You say, well, preacher, there's a lot of world views. No, really only two world views. One world view says every man is a good man and he just does bad because of his environment and how it, how it affects him. The other worldview says every man is a sinner born that way. His environment doesn't make him bad. He's bad from the start and he needs to be born again. And I subscribe to that second worldview. We're all sinners and we need to be saved. You say, well, preacher, can't anybody do anything good? I know sometimes you're, you do something good. Sometimes I do something good. But everything we do is short of the glory of God and short of of what we're commanded. So you're in one of those two world views tonight. Now, when we get to this next verse, this next young man, this is the man I'm interested in tonight. Starting in verse number 8, the Bible said this, Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as an old lion, 
who shall rouse him up? You know what? Did we start in verse 9? Did we do verse 8? Look in verse 8. We may have missed verse 8. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey, my son. Thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion. And as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be, binding his foal under the vine, and his asses cold under the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine, and his teeth white with milk. So Jacob is going to speak about Judah, and I want to preach a little while on Judah, and the subject of the message or the title is this. I want to preach a little bit on going beyond the best. Going beyond the best. Now let's pray just a moment. Ask the Lord to help us. Father, we need your help tonight. We want to thank you for loving us. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. And I pray you'll help us tonight and that you'll get glory unto yourself. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now here in Genesis 49, Jacob will speak of his son Judah. If I were to ask you this tonight, out of all the boys that Jacob had, we talk about Reuben and Simeon and Judah, we talk about Levi, we talk about Zebulun and Issachar and Gad and Naphtali and Asher and Joseph and Benjamin and then later the grandsons of Manasseh and Ephraim. If I were to ask you tonight, which one of these boys was the best? Which one of them was the top of the rung? Which one of them at this time in Jacob's life when he's getting ready to die because he'll, he will give up the ghost, the Bible said at the end of this chapter, which one of them would you think that Jacob would think was the best that he had? Now, right off the bat, I would think of Joseph because Joseph was his beloved son. But that's not what Jacob says here at the end of his life. Jacob will say some good things about Joseph, but we have just read about the boy that Jacob thinks is the best that he has, and his name is Judah. I want you to look at what Jacob says about him. He's telling us in these words, he would be saying to us, if you look at all my sons, Judah is the best I have. Now watch what he says. He says in verse 8, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise... He said, thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. So the first thing he'll tell us is that Judah is the most praiseworthy of all his sons. Now notice he said this, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren, that includes Joseph. He's saying all of those boys are going to praise Judah. They're going to say, Judah, you're the best. Judah, you're better than I am. All the boys. Then he said this. He said, thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Now that's Old Testament language. That means that all of Judah's enemies, he's going to overcome them. And when he overcomes them, they're going to have to look at him and say, you're better than we are. Then he says this, just in case anybody else is left out. He said, thy brethren shall praise thee. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Then he said this, all thy father's children shall bow down to thee. Now you remember that Jacob did not have just sons. He had at least one daughter named Dinah. And so he's not leaving her out either. He's saying everybody, the brethren, the enemies, and all of my children are going to have to look at Judah and say, you're the best there is. You're the best we've got. There ain't anybody better in this family. So he's telling us that Judah is the most praiseworthy of all of his children. Then I want you to notice the next thing he says. Look in verse number 9. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion. And as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? So the next thing he says about Judah is that he's like a lion. Now what would we call a lion? Well, we call him the king of beasts, don't we? And so when you think about a lion, you think about power. The power of that king of beasts. Now, you may not have noticed it, you, you might have, but in that verse, there are three separate lions. There is, first of all, a lion's whelp. What is a lion's whelp? That's a young lion. What would it be about a young lion that would be, that would be striking? I think it would be the same thing that's true of all of youth. It would be his energy. Did you ever notice the energy young people have? I stand with a fellow the other day, and this little fellow was at the church, and I mean, he was everywhere at once. He was what I call full of juice. He's just all over the place. 
And that fellow looked at him and said, man, I'd like to have his energy. And I looked at him and said, not me. I'm wore out just watching the boy. And so he's a lion's, Judah's like a lion's whelp. And what he's saying is Judah will have unbounded energy. Then he says this, he said, from the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion. Now, here's the lion that's taken the prey. Do you notice what it said? From the prey, he's gone up. This is the adult lion. And what is, the, what is it about the adult lion? It is his expertise. He is able to go out. The young lion has a lot of energy, but he don't know how to put that energy to use. But the adult lion knows how to go out and catch the prey. And so Jacob is saying Judah will not only have the energy of a young lion, he'll have the expertise of an adult lion. And then he ends with the old lion. He said, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? Now, this is, I call it the exaltation of the old lion. And I look at it like this. If you're walking around through the jungle and you come upon an old lion and he's resting, you know what you better do? You better keep on walking. You best not mess with him. You don't want to go over and pull his tail or pull his mane or pull the beard of that. You don't want to mess with that old lion because if you mess with him, you're in trouble. Now, here's what Jacob's saying. He's saying when it comes to praise, Judah's the best I've got. He's saying when it comes to power, Judah is the best we have. Then notice this, and we'll come back to verse 10 in a moment. But look in verse 11 and 12. He says, binding his foal under the vine, and his ass is cold under the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. And his eyes shall be red with wine, and his teeth white with milk. Now here's the third thing he's saying about Judah. He's more praiseworthy than his brethren. He's more powerful than anybody else. He is also more prosperous than anybody else we have. Now look at what he said here. And I think he may be speaking a little bit symbolically in these verses, but he's given us an idea of the prosperity of this man Judah. Watch what he said in verse 11. Binding his foal under the vine and his ass's colt under the choice vine. Now let me ask you a question. If you had the colt, the foal of an ass, a donkey, we would call it today, uh, and you tied it to a vine to hold it, that'd have to be a pretty strong vine, wouldn't it? My pastor has donkeys. When they get going the way they want to go, it's hard to turn them. It's hard to stop them. They, they are uh, stubborn and they are strong. And so I'm thinking what, what Jacob is saying to us, if you were to go into Judah's vineyard, you would find vines so strong and so thick that you could tie the, an ass to those vines, a donkey to them, and he couldn't break them. Then he said this. He said he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Now here's a question. What do you wash your clothes in wash them in water you know why is it we wash them in water because water is plentiful what Jacob's saying is Judah will be so prosperous that he has wine like you have water he could wash his clothes in it he has so much of it then he'll say this his eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk he's saying if you came by Judah's house You'd find his eyes red because he has so much wine to drink. And when he smiled, you'd see the remains of the milk in his teeth. He'd have it dripping off his mouth. He has an abundance of wine and milk. Now he's talking about the prosperity of Judah. Now listen to me. Here's what Jacob is saying in a nutshell. He's saying of all my children, Judah's the best we've got. Nobody's as good as him. He is the absolute best. That's what Jacob's opinion of Judah was. Now let's look at another opinion of Judah. Look in Genesis 29 a moment. Genesis 29, here we have the birth of this man Judah. And let's hear, we've heard what his father said. Let's hear what his mama has to say about him. Now you remember that Jacob married sisters. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying that's what happened. It's one thing about the Bible. It just tells you like it is. And so Jacob married sisters, Leah and Rachel. And the Bible said he loved Rachel more than Leah. Loved her more than Leah. So he's married to these two sisters. I'll just say this to you in passing. The only good thing about marrying sisters, you only get one mother-in-law out of the deal. But he married <laughs> sisters, Rachel and Leah. So he's married to these two sisters. And listen what happens now. He loves Rachel more than Leah. doesn't say he doesn't love Leah. He said he loves her more. Now look at the text. Genesis 29. And look at verse number, uh, verse number 30. 
And he went in also unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah, and served with him seven other years. There's a whole story there. I don't have time to go into it. Verse 31. Now watch what this says. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, Jacob loved Rachel so much more than he loved Leah that the love he had for Leah looked like hatred next to the love that he had for Rachel. Now, let me stop and throw this in. This will help you when you get to the New Testament and you read a verse like this. Jesus said, if you're going to be my disciple, you have to hate your mama, hate your daddy, hate your brethren. You say, what in the world is he saying? He's saying what we just learned right here. That Jesus said, you ought to love me so much that the love you have for anybody else ought to look like hatred in comparison to the love that you have for me. That's what these, these verses explain that to us. And then he says this, And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her room, but Rachel was barren. All right, now Leah is going to have children. I want you to watch how she names them. In verse 32, And Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, Surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction. Now watch this. Now therefore my husband will love me. She said, I've got this boy now. The word Reuben, the name means see a son. And it's, it's as though she took that baby and, and, and brought him to Jacob and said, Look, I've given you something Rachel hasn't given you, a son. Won't you love me now? That's what she wants more than anything in the world. She wants Jacob to love her. I can understand that, can't you? So she, she names the boy. Now my husband will love me, see a son. Then she has another son. Look in verse 33. And she conceived again and bare a son and said, Because the Lord hath heard that I was hated, he hath therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. And so here the second boy, she names him again according or in reference to the fact that her husband doesn't love her. Then look in verse 34. She conceived again and bare a son and said, Now this time will my husband be joined unto me, which is what the name Levi means, to be joined. Husband should be joined unto me because I born him three sons. Therefore was his name called Levi. Now are you noticing a trend here? Every boy is named something to have to do with the fact that Jacob does not love Leah and Leah wants to be loved. It is the desire of her heart. But she's going to have a fourth son. His name is Judah. And look what the Bible said. And she conceived again and bare a son. And she said, Now will I praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah, which means praise, and left barren. Now think about this a moment. All of the three sons that Leah had, the first three, she named everyone a name that had to do with the fact that she was missing something in her life. She wanted to be loved by her husband. But when this fourth son comes along, she doesn't say anything about that. She doesn't mention the fact that Jacob doesn't love her. She looks at Judah, and I don't know what it was. I don't know what it was about him. The Bible doesn't tell us what she saw, but when she looked at him, she did not say, boy, my husband doesn't love me. I wish he loved me. I'm not happy. Here's what she says. I'm going to praise the Lord. Now will I praise the Lord. And then the Holy Ghost gives us this little phrase, and she left bearing. It's as though the Bible said she, she went as far as she could go. She's got the best now. So Jacob is telling us, Judah's the best we've got. Leah's telling us, Judah's the best we have. But do you remember we skipped over verse 10? Let's go back and look at it. Genesis 49. Watch it now. Let's read from the beginning again. Verse 8. Judah... Thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion. And as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? Now watch verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now, we've got to establish a question, answer a question here. What's the question? Who or what is Shiloh? God, Jacob said, Judah's the best we have. Leah said, Judah's the best we have. But in the middle of this statement, God speaks to us through Jacob and said, He's not the best I have. Well, who is Shiloh? Well, there was a city named Shiloh. 
But notice the Bible said, until Shiloh comes. Cities don't move. Cities don't show up. So we're not talking about a place. Well, what is Shiloh? No, Shiloh's not a what? Shiloh is a whom. Who is Shiloh? Shiloh is the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, preacher, how do you know Shiloh is Jesus? Because the word Shiloh means the bringer of tranquility or the bringer of peace. What does Isaiah say is one title of the Lord Jesus? He's the prince of peace. What does the Bible say in Thessalonians about Jesus? It calls him the Lord of peace. Of peace. Now here's what I believe the Holy Ghost is saying to us in this passage. Jacob's saying Judah is the best there is. He's, he's on top. Nobody's like him. Uh, Leah's saying Judah is the best there is. Nobody can measure up. He's the best we have. But God is saying I've got somebody better than Judah. And that somebody better is Jesus. He is better than the best. Anything Judah can do, Jesus can do better. Anything that Judah has, Jesus has more. Any good thing you can say. And the truth of the matter is, here's how it applies to you and I. We look at ourselves and we say, well, I'm better than so-and-so. You may be better than so-and-so, but Jesus is better than you are. You say, well, preacher, I live better than the pastor. You may live better than the pastor, but you don't live as good as Jesus lived. You say, well, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be pleasing to the Lord, and you you may be in some area, but you're not pleasing like Jesus is pleasing. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. See, you can be the best there is. You can be the best man on your street. You can be the best man at your job. You can be the best lady in your circle. You can be the best human being that you can possibly be and still not be good enough to get to heaven. There is somebody better, and that somebody is Jesus. Amen. The Bible said, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to our own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. In the New Testament, the Bible said, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. All of us have come short. None of us measure up. You say, well, I'll tell you, preacher, everybody tells me how good I am. Everybody told Judah how good he was. You say, well, preacher, I'm powerful. I have influence. Judah had influence too. You say, well, preacher, I'm wealthy. I've, I've worked hard. I've gained a lot of things. Judah was prosperous, but he was the best until Shiloh came. Jesus is better. Now, I said we want to look in Revelation. I want you to, I want you to turn there a moment to Revelation 4 and Revelation 5. And let's just think about this. Let's think about this a moment. Revelation 4 and Revelation 5. We're going to, John gets to look into heaven. God rolls back the curtain of heaven, as it were, and allows John to look into the future and see what's going on in heaven. And uh, he sees, we won't read all of chapter 4. We won't even read all of chapter 5. But in chapter 4, he sees a throne. The Bible said in verse 2, I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. There's some wonderful truth there. We don't have time for it tonight. And then he sees the elders around the throne. That's a picture of the believers, the born again. And he sees us worshiping. And then in chapter 5, he begins to talk about Jesus. Look in verse 5, chapter 5. He's talk, he talked about Jesus in chapter 4, the one that was on the throne. Now he'll go in depth about Jesus. And one of the elders said to me, weep not. Watch this. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Who is that? That's the Lord Jesus. The root of David. Who is that? That's the Lord Jesus. Hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld and lo in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain. You say, preacher, who's that lamb? Do you remember in the Gospels when John the Baptist was baptizing and people were coming and they were confessing their sin and John was baptizing them and then all of a sudden standing in line is Jesus of Nazareth and John looked at him and he said, behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And so we find this Lamb is the Lord Jesus. He is God's Lamb. And notice what it said. There stood a Lamb 
Adam as it had been slain. Now we'll come back to that. But they began to sing about this lamb. Look in verse 9. And they sung a new song saying, Thou, the lamb, thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts of and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Now let me say this to you. Judah was praiseworthy but Jesus is more praiseworthy than Judah. Who was going to praise Judah? His brethren, his enemies and his father's children. But you know what the Bible said in the book of Psalms? Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. So if you're breathing, Jesus is worthy of your praise. You said, preacher, what are they doing in heaven right now? We just read what they're doing in heaven right now. They're telling Jesus how praiseworthy he is. They're worshiping him. They're lifting him up. Somebody said, well, preacher, I'm a pretty good person and when I, when I come to the gate of heaven, I'll tell them how good I am. They're not interested in hearing how good you are or how good I am because all they can think of is how good Jesus is, how praiseworthy he he is, how wonderful he is. He is the central theme of heaven. He's more praiseworthy. He's not only more praiseworthy, he's more powerful. Now you remember what we read in our text? Jacob said Judah is a lion's whelp. Now if you're a lion's whelp, that means you're one of many, right? If we were to say, if we were to say tonight, Maranatha Baptist Church is a church in Covington. What we'd say is it's one of several churches. But what if we were to say tonight, Maranatha Baptist Church is the church in Covington. What would we be saying? We'd say there's not another church like it. All right, Jacob said Judah is a lion's well. But what did we read, just read in our text? Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. When we looked into heaven with John, we found out there wasn't anybody as powerful as Jesus. He said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And I'm saying to you, there is no power like the power of Christ. You know what kind of power he has? He had the power to defeat death, hell, and the grave. He had the power to overcome Satan. He has the power tonight to wash you clean of your sin, to resurrect you from deadness to newness of life. He has the power to make you acceptable in the sight of God the Father. And he is the only one that has that power. He said it himself in the book of John. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. In the book of Acts, Paul and Silas said to that man, there, uh, that man with the withered hand, he said, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. He is more praiseworthy than Judah. He is more powerful than Judah, and he is more prosperous than Judah. You know what the Bible tells us about him? It tells us he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. My old friend Brother Kelly used to say he not only owns the cattle on a thousand hills, he owns the taters under the hills. <laughs> but I want you to look in Isaiah 55. I want you to notice this passage. Remember, Jacob had a lot to say about Judah's wine and milk. You remember that? All right, I want you to notice Isaiah 55. Watch what the Bible says in verse 1. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth, Come ye to the waters, now watch this, and he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat, yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Now what is Isaiah the prophet talking about? What's he talking about, wine and milk? All right, if we would read on, we won't read all these verses, but go down and read verse 7 with me, watch it. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Now we just found out what the context of this chapter is about. 
It's about pardon and mercy and forgiveness. And so Isaiah speaking figuratively, giving us a, a, a little parable, if you will, about forgiveness says this. He said, if you come to God and ask Him for forgiveness, it would be like you going to somebody rich that had wine and milk and you asking them and they give it to you for free as much as you need it and you didn't have to pay for it. He said that's the way it is with forgiveness from God. You don't have to pay for it. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to make some promise. You don't have to meet some, meet some stipulation or standard. Here's what happens. You come to Christ and tell Him you're a sinner and you want Him to forgive you of your sin. You know what He'll do? He'll do exactly that. He'll forgive you of your sin. Now, as rich as Judah was, if people keep coming and asking him for wine and milk, you know what's going to happen eventually? He's going to run out. But Isaiah's telling us when people come to God for forgiveness, he never runs out. You won't ever come to him and say, Lord, I know I've done wrong. I'm a sinner and I want to be saved. I want to be forgiven of my sin. You'll never hear him say, sorry, we ran out of forgiveness. We ran out of pardon. No, you'll never hear him say that. He'll never run out. You'll never hear him say, well, what can you give me? No, he just says, come. Jesus put it this way. Come unto me, all you that labor and you're heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Do you remember what he said to the woman at the well? In John chapter 4, that woman was there and, and he asked her for water and, and, and she said the well, uh, uh, she, he, he, she said to him, how is it that thou being a Jew askest me of water seeing the Jews have no dealing with the Samaritans? And then he said this, he said, if thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that speaketh unto thee, thou wouldest asked of him and he would have given thee living water. Now think about what he said. He said, if you knew the gift of God, in other words, if you knew what salvation was and who it is that speaketh unto thee, if you knew that I could give it to you, all you'd have to do is ask me and I'd give it to you. March the 10th of 1980, about 11 o'clock on a Saturday night, I did just that. I told the Lord I was a sinner. I asked him to forgive me my sin. And you know what? I found out he had not run out of grace. He had not run out of mercy, and he still hadn't run out of mercy, and he still hadn't run out of grace, and you haven't run out of time. You can still be saved if you want to be. Now let me say this, and I'm, I'm just about done. Je Jesus is more praiseworthy than Judah. Jesus is more powerful than Judah. Jesus is more prosperous than Judah. But Jesus has done something that Judah could never do. Back in our text in Revelation, he says something very unusual. If you're back there in Revelation 5, look at verse 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, now pay close attention to these words, stood a lamb as it had been slain. Now, we have a problem. What's the problem, preacher? The word slain means to die or to be put to death with cruelty. So this lamb has been cruelly put to death. But did you notice the Bible said he's standing up? Stood a lamb as it had been slain. Slain lambs don't stand up. Slain lambs are laid out. But here is a slain lamb who is standing. He was dead, but now he's alive. Who is this slain lamb? We've already seen who he is. He's Jesus. And you know what happened to Jesus. They crucified him. He died a cruel death on the cross of Calvary. But what happened three days later? He got up and walked out of the grave. He resurrected. Judah could never do that. But Jesus did that. 
He's already done something that Judah could not do. And he can still do something that Judah could never do. Now back in our text in Genesis 49, here's what it says. The scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Why do you need a scepter and why do you need a lawgiver? The scepter is, an, is, is a, a power and authority or we could put it this way, the scepter is the power and the lawgiver is the authority that gives the scepter its power. Now why do you need a power and why do you need, why do you need a lawgiver? Why do you need a, a scepter? Because people won't live in peace. Because we're all sinners. And we won't live in peace unless somebody puts a law on us. But the Bible said there'll be a scepter and a lawgiver until. Until what? Until Jesus comes. Because you know what happens? When Jesus comes and he saves your soul, he makes you a new creature in Christ. And he writes his laws, the Bible says, on our hearts. And now we're not living right because of any outward law. Now we won't live right because of an inward law. Now we're walking according to the perfect law, Galatians says, and Paul says, of liberty. We have liberty from the bondage of sin to live for Christ. Jesus did that for us. You know what Jesus can do for you that no one else can? He can give you peace. He can stop the war inside of you. He can give you a peace. He can give you the peace peace with God and he can give you the peace of God now down in here he can calm the storm and give you peace because he's the Lord of peace now what should we do with all of this well the best that man can accomplish is nothing compared to what God can do and the best that man can produce is nothing compared to what Christ can do. So there's two things I think of when I think of these, these truths, these things we find in the Bible about Judah and about Christ, Shiloh. The first thing I think is, no matter how good you are, you're not good enough. You've come short. You might lay your head down on the pillow at night and count the good things you've done and convince yourself that God will let you into heaven. But the Bible said, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. You say, well, I've been baptized. I've joined the church. I don't lie. I don't steal. I, I try to do right. I, I give a full day's work for a full pay. I, I'm a good person. I'm as good as so-and-so. You can write you down a list. But it'll never be good enough. Because you're short of the glory of God. The only way you're going to get to heaven is if Jesus, who is perfect, will give you his righteousness. It's your only hope. No other way. The other thing I think of is this. If you're a Christian tonight, you know you're saved. There have been a time, you, you could say, preacher, I can tell you about the time when I told the Lord I was a sinner and I asked him to forgive me of my sin and he did save me and I've been born again. I know I'm on my way to heaven. Okay, then let me ask you this question. Do you ever feel like you don't measure up? You ever feel like you, like even though you're saved and on your way to heaven, you ever feel like you didn't make the grade, like you didn't, you didn't quite meet the need? You're, you always just, you just kind of felt short. And I want to remind you of something. Jesus is better. And he'll make up the difference in your life. He'll do for you what you can't do for yourself. He'll make up the difference when you feel like you've come short. You know, some years ago, I was preaching through the book of Ruth. You remember that little Moabite girl was out there in the, in the field and she was gleaning. I mean, she was picking up the sheaves that had grain on them. The Bible said she stayed from the morning till the evening. And she brought back, I think she brought back an ephah of barley. And she carried it home to her mother-in-law. She was out there all day long. She kept on doing that every day until chapter 
the end of chapter 2, the Bible said, is the end of wheat harvest and barley harvest. Now Ruth has a problem. She has come to the end of her own ability. There's nothing left in the field. There's nothing more she can do. So what does she do? Remember what she does in chapter 3? She goes and lays down at the feet of Boaz. He wakes up in the night. Here's a woman laying, I believe, crossways at his feet. He said, who art thou? She, asked, she said, I'm uh, Ruth, thine handmaid. Uh, Ruth, I'm Ruth. And she said, spread thine ha- uh, skirt over thine handmaid for thou art a near kinsman. And uh, I won't go into all of that. But during that, during that exchange, during that conversation, when they get done talking, here's what the Bible said Boaz does. He said, bring, bring hither the veil that thou hast. That was that, not this burqa thing, but that outer coat that was all around her. He said, bring me that veil. So she brings it. And the Bible said he measured out six measures of barley. And then the Bible uses this language. He laid it on her. I like the sound of that. She couldn't lift it. It was so much. He had to lift it off the ground and lay it on her. And he said, go not empty thy mother-in-law. Now here's the point. She came to the end of her resources. And when she got to the end of what she could do, she found out what Boaz could do. And he could do so much more than what she could do. And if you and I would recognize when we come to the end of our own ability, We'll lay down at his feet and trust him. He'll do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Can I just say this about Jesus tonight? There isn't anybody like him. He's beyond the best that humanity has to offer. I want you to bow your heads a moment, if you would, please. Your heads are bowed.